Hey, everybody. Uh, any fans of Borderlands in the house? You're, you're probably going to like this. Uh, uh, this is Brian McNett. He's a lead shader artist from the uh, Borderlands team at Gearbox. I'm on the Borderlands team right now. Uh, we're going to show you some technology that we're building within UE4 that will power the next Borderlands game. Uh, what you're going to see is not a video game, it's a technology demonstration. Uh, we use Unreal Engine 4 to render a non-realistic art style, uh, the style that you've come to know as the Borderlands art style. Uh, this is a very simple scene. Uh, now, I want you to remember that the Borderlands art style is sort of represented by a confluence of techniques. Most of the Borderlands art style comes from the content itself, the form of the environment, silhouettes and movement of characters, the color and line work within the surfaces of objects. But there's some fundamental rendering technologies that contribute to the look that we are exploring for the next generation. Now, I think the technique that most of you probably attribute to Borderlands the most is the edge outlining. Uh, it's not cell shading, but we do outline the edges. And if he goes into the black and white view, you can see this approach for Borderlands 2, Borderlands 1, and Borderlands the pre-sequel. Uh, this is a standard Sobel Feldman edge detection operator. It's a solid, uh, a uniform line weight around the outlines of objects that we detect in the rendering. Uh, now, we want to evolve this look for the future. We want to, to, to make it more natural and, 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 and basically next gen. Uh, then we go to variable line weight. Uh, this is really important. We also want to do inside silhouettes uh, and edge lines. So if, if you look at the black and white view again, you can see that there's detailed line work with a variable line weight on the inside of the objects now to, to highlight more detail in the scene. Uh, but with variable line weight on both the inside and the outside uh, of, of the edge lines, uh, we can now kind of show uh, detail that's affected by the lighting and the orientation of the camera. So we can look at the scene again in color. And now edges are only a part of it. The surface materials themselves are very important. The artists contribute to the look and feel of the, the graphic style by how they paint the materials. Now this is a test sphere, and it shows some materials, uh, uh, on, or a material on there, and you'll notice there's little black outlines, edges around it. Uh, those black outlines are drawn into the materials themselves, and they're, they're kind of similar to that edge outline, but they're drawn onto the material. Uh, we want to render those edge outlines in ways that aren't affected uh, by the lighting of the scene. Uh, so now we can isolate those, and we can make them look like wet ink. Uh, so you'll notice that only the black outlines are reflective, like, like as if it's a wet ink. Or we can make them look like metal. Uh, or we can keep them as solid black lines, just like the edge outlines in the scene. And now they're not taking any light at all. There's no highlights there. Uh, this is really important for the artist's scribbles and doodles and cross hatching, which simulates shadows, uh, to come through for the scene. Uh, the, the neat thing about this test sphere, though, is it also gives us the opportunity to show you how we can use a, a similar technique to, to, to actually render cross-hatching dependent on the lighting in the scene. So if he goes to black and white view and brings up the cross-hatching, you'll see there's now a cross-hatch layer which will render shadow only where shadows exist and, in fact, render highlights only where highlights exist. These are custom materials that are on top of the base material that, that add to the, the complexity of the scene. Uh, uh, the, the other step, though, is, um, uh, in fact, let's look at a production asset. I want to see this in a production asset really quick. Now, this is a very, unre or very uh, uh, gear Borderlands gearbox looking uh, uh, production asset rendered in Unreal Engine 4. Uh, you'll notice that even the little bolts on those objects are casting a little shadow, and those shadows are taking a little bit of crosshatch. Uh, that's that's that, that custom crosshatch layer there. And we can see it again in black and white. Uh, now, one of the problems with this approach, though, and why we had to advance even further, is in the Borderlands work that we do, we tend to do a lot of kit bashing. We'll, we'll use assets in lots of interesting ways, lots of different ways. We'll scale those assets up and down. And uh, when we scale an asset up, it, it will actually change the scale of that cross-hatching, which makes it inconsistent with the line work that we're doing on the edges. So we wanted to work with a, a, an experiment with a procedural approach to this, using artist-generated cross-hatches, but rendering them more procedurally on the surface of the objects. So if we start with this gray sphere and we put a crosshatch on it that's now procedural and mapped to the object, you can see that, that it'll, it'll hold the same consistency at any scale. Uh, and in fact, uh, we also want to show a highlight on this as well. So we can render a highlight on the other side. Now you notice that the transition between the highlight and the shadow is not perfectly uniform. We think that the artist's hand is really important in the style and feel of Borderlands. So you'll notice it almost looks like someone took like a spray paint can to start to spray paint that, that shadow on there. And the ink 
didn't perfectly fall on that surface uh, as, as, as you'd expect uh, uh, from a software rendered solution. So that transition is not uniform. Uh, now, I also want to point out that this has full interaction with PVR. So as he affects roughness, you'll notice that the reflections erode the inks. Uh, or if he changes to a highly reflective metal surface, uh, all of the inks take shape, the, the shape of the objects that the metal's reflecting. Uh, this is really incredible technology, and this is only accessible to us with Unreal Engine 4 and the current and future hardware specifications that we're targeting with this technology. Uh, now let's look at a more complex shape, a no more complex form. Uh, this form right now is smooth, but we have a normal map for this form. And you'll notice that there, it looks like there's a gearbox icon that's sort of etched into the metal shape that you're seeing there. Uh, that is not a mesh. That's actually a normal map. And I, I, some of you are probably familiar with these are. But you'll notice that the normal maps fully interact with, uh, with all of the other technologies, the, the shading and the lighting. So if it goes into a black and white view, you can see that even the cross hatches and the highlights are affected uh, 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 by that normal map. That's, that's pretty awesome stuff. So um, uh, let's, let's look at uh, actually a production asset with this technology on it. So this is a real asset that will go into a future video game. And you can see that the, the, the interaction fully works, whether it's metal. Looking at it in black and white, you can make out all of the fine details uh, just from the shadows, the highlights, and, and the edge lines. Uh, but also, it looks beautiful in full color. Uh, so this is the fully rendered object. Uh, now let's go back to the original scene. Uh, uh, back at this original scene, uh, you can notice that Brian can take control of the intensity and the range bias for crosshatches and highlights. Um, if we add a character, yeah, you can see him affect that. This gives our artists a lot of flexibility, and it also allows the, sim the scene to simulate in real time as, as time of day changes, or as maybe conceivably we have different physics if we, for example, were to explore different planets. There might be different physics in the sun, and the, and the, the moons might be in different positions than we're used to on Pandora. Uh, now, uh, if we add a character to the scene, it gets really interesting. Uh, this is a character that is a production asset, and you can see that the effect that the sunlight has on the inks. You'll also notice that there's a, an effect we call the ray of God, where the, the sunlight is sort of piercing through uh, the, the gap between her arm and her body. And uh, you'll notice that there's rays that come out from that. Uh, if he goes into the black and white view, you'll notice that those, those rays, the, the god rays, will actually erode the crosshatches uh, in the environment, even the, the crosshatches that are rendered onto objects that are behind and far away from where the ray of god effect is being simulated. This is pretty awesome stuff, and it helps create a, a more complex and, and, and plausible scene, even in the unrealistic art style of Borderlands that we're rendering with Unreal Engine 4. Uh, let's take another step. Uh, there's a technique when we bring characters into the scene, when we bring soft bodies into the scene, and we bring um, kind of um, not, not totally opaque bodies into the scene, they're called subsurface scattering. You see that tarp is made of cloth. And, uh, and her body, has, is, is she's got skin, right? And if you've ever shown you the, the light on your phone, phone through, your, through your own hand, you can see the light will actually pass through surface. It's not always, uh, not always uh, absorbed by the surfaces. I want you to forget about the fact that, that we've cleverly placed the camera here so that her shoulder pad is occluding her face. Don't worry about the character. Worry about the technology right now. Uh, if, if we go inside, if we go inside, we can see that the light actually s shines through so that where the character is, she's occluding the sun. It creates a shadow there, um, the, the, the ray of God is still perfectly interacting. So even with subsurface scattering, all of these technologies perfectly interact. And in black and white, you can see the proof. Uh, this also works in soft bodies, which is pretty awesome. Um, uh, this is a, a really complex object that's doing some fluid dynamic simulation. You can see that the cross hatching and the highlights still work. All of the lighting works in the correct ways, even when it's interacting with the, uh, with the, the God rays. Uh, and sometimes, though, we'll have surfaces that we don't want to take shadows on, uh, such as uh, if we have clean water and, and the simulation works perfectly. It's just a beautiful simulation using Unreal Engine 4. Uh, now, let's bring this all uh, together. We can actually go into an interior environment. Uh, in this environment, I want you to, to imagine that there's an invisible light bulb that Brian has control of that's sort of floating uh, right in front of those barrels there. And, and our artists and, and designers and, and, and set lighters can, can affect the lighting and the intensity and the, the radius of these lights. Uh, and, and, and we can dynamically affect the scene in real time or, or set it up in advance exactly the way we want it to make it look right. Uh, one of the cool things about this, if we take this one step further, though, is we can have these lights 
it's actually corrupt, distort, and affect those, those shadow maps, those, those, uh, those, those, those cross hatches and those highlights that I was talking about. So here's a case where the lighting is actually corrupting and distorting uh, the, sh the, 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 the shadow maps. If you go to the black and white, you can really see uh, how this looks. It's, it's really interesting, and this is really useful for, for special effects and for special case lighting. So if we go back to color, we'll, we'll run a two-dimensional uh, uh, explosion effect. This is a temporary effect, but you can actually see how the lighting affects the scene around it while the explosion goes off, and it corrupts the, uh, the, and distorts the, the shadows in real time. Uh, in addition, if he runs it in slow motion, you can even see the volumetric smoke effects perfectly interacting with the scene. They're emphasizing the crosshatch shadows where the smoke creates shade, but only until the smoke clears. This is all happening in real time with the simulation. It's beautiful. So now I'm going to have Brian just trigger a uh, matinee sequence that'll pull us out of the scene, and you can see all this coming together, and it gives you a sense of, of what a future uh, game from Gearbox might look like. Now, um, uh, I, I do want to remind you that this is not a video game. This is a technology demonstration of some ongoing research and development at Gearbox Software. Some or all of the technologies that I, I demonstrated may be utilized for future Gearbox Software video games. Uh, if you are a technology company that thinks you can benefit uh, from a partnership with Gearbox uh, as we explore this technology, feel free to reach out to me. Um, if you're a talented developer that would like to work with us on this technology and help it push it further, uh, please let us know. Uh, also, if you're a customer that's looking forward uh, to a future Borderlands game, we'll, we'll, we're working on it. Uh, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get you soon. Um, on behalf of all the talented artists and programmers and designers and developers at Gearbox Software, I'm, I'm uh, thankful that you've taken the time to see this with us. I also want to thank Tim for, for letting us come up on stage and everybody on his team for delivering the incredible Unreal Engine 4 technology that we're using to power our future games. Thank you. Thank you.